Ithaca, New York, was never the filmmaking capital of the world, nor were the perils of Pauline ever made there. It was a small and, for a time, flourishing production center, not unlike so many others, when film was a young and growing medium. But there are those who remember the times for what they were. They remember when they made movies in Ithaca. in 1913 was a small resort. Its location at the base of Cuba Lake in the New York Finger Lakes region and the climate made it an ideal tourist attraction. It had beautiful scenery, its own amusement park, and the excitement of Cornell's Big Red football team. Into that environment came Theodore and Leo Wharton to film the team that played high above Cuba's waters in a game against Penn State. They stayed longer than they had planned. I remember Ted Wharton very well. He gave me a pass to get in the studio at any time when there was uh, scenes in the operation, you know. <laughs> established their studio at Renwick, the old amusement park at the end of the lake. The park had been organized by the Ithaca Street Railway Company several years before, and the Whartons first arranged its lease and then later its purchase. The old open-air roller skating rink was enlarged and became the sound stage and base of their operations. Yeah, it was a big barn-like thing, the stage up in the back, very dark in there. And the uh, back area was lighted with lights all around it. it was, all the sets was lighted. And they had scenery men and electricians there all the time working on changing things from one set to the next. But the rest of it was just a large barn-like building with a little room off the side that was cutting room. They converted some buildings and erected others to suit the needs of production. A cutting room was added to the sound stage. Quarters were created for the 1,001 props, set pieces, and costumes of the company. The tower served as the administrative office. Shirley Bass was the secretary. The office, not too small, it had a typewriter, and, and then uh, Mr. Buck had a, uh, a desk and an office in one corner, and, Theodore had another table, and Leopold had another. They were all had, you know, a place in the office. And then on the walls, they had pictures of uh, stars who were known then. And 
and so the stars came to Ithaca. It was an overnight ride from New York and a good three days from Chicago on the Limited. trips were nothing compared to the rigors of shooting schedules. But then, those were the days when the three-reeler was finished in three days. Uh, Earl Hyde jumped off in the submarine into the lake, which at that point was, oh, maybe ten feet deep, and uh, swam ashore. Earl White. Uh sashaying around the Ithaca Hotel where she lived. I was over on the corner that's now a vacant lot. But she held forth over there uh, to the excitement of practically everybody. She was a very profane uh, person. She uh, wandered around town in a uh, Stutz Bearcat. She was Going through Trumansburg, which is a little north of here, village, and uh, there was a time when uh, there were very strict uh, speed laws, and she was picked up by a deputy sheriff uh, for speeding, and was hauled into a justice of the peace court in Trumansburg. And uh, he was quite strict with her. He uh, reprimanded her for speeding. And after some debate of himself, he said, young lady, he said it'll cost you five dollars for your folly. And with that, she whipped out of her chair picked up a $10 bill out of her stocking and put it on the desk and turned and said goodbye, Whiskers. And he said, wait a minute. He said, you have $5 change coming. He said, keep it, Whiskers. I'm going out of your goddamn town just as fast as I came in. I know my grandmother didn't want me to be in those movies because reports of her of drinking and well, I don't think she drank any more than normal people do now. She disgusted me many times by kissing me and she had lipstick on. <laughs> and I got razzed to death by the other bellhops. They came to Ithaca, star and filmmaker alike because of the natural beauty of the locale. Nowhere else could they find the variety of terrains that figured so largely in their exterior-oriented productions. They had the gorges by Cornell, the falls of Taganic, and the lakefronts of Beebe and Cayuga.
went for the natural location and the realism that they provided. For the filming of the white slave trade epic, the Great White Trail, the wardens chose Upper Enfield in Tompkins County. It wasn't Alaska, but the snow was real. And in fact, we went out in two trucks out to Enfield Park for that shooting out there. The, it was supposed to be a gold rush scene, the, the Yukon, in uh, Alaska. The Great White Trail was the name of it. We got two dollars and a half a day in our meal, uh, noontime meal, which was cold egg sandwiches and black coffee. And uh, I got quite a thrill out of it. And... But some situations didn't change. Ithaca had the dubious distinction of being between what some old timers called the dark belt and the wet belt of New York State. The area got the worst of both conditions, and the weather began to get the better of the wardens. But it didn't dampen the spirit of the times. It was the age of the cliffhanger. The cereal was everybody's favorite matinee, and the stunt was a recognized art form. The cereal was big business in Ithaca. The exploits of Elaine, the romance of Elaine, and the new exploits of Elaine all starred Pearl White and stirred the embers of excitement in the balcony. In a good afternoon, one could expect the heroine to be hurled off a moving train, tied to the tracks, chastised by the villain, and idolized by the hero, only to be left on the brink of danger as the matinee closed. You came to the movies remembering last week's dangerous climax, knowing it would all work out, and yet there you were at dusk, hurrying home for dinner, wondering how they'd save the day next week. I was there on the, just above the gun company where you could see the whole ravine, and they put the railers on the bridge, and then they set off the villain and the heroine and the conductor and the motorman down the hill and up and close down to the derailed and it fell over the edge. And I was much impressed by how long it seemed to take to go 150 feet vertically. And when they go, in the meantime, of course, the hero had jumped on the trolley and rescued the lady. And uh, then I was so, so impressed by the way it appeared when they, when they landed because they all try just to complete the center of the great cloud of dust in the bottom of the gorge. Here's the way they played the same scene in the controversial Patria. It was made in Ithaca in 1919 by the Whartons, and for a time banned by President Wilson for its inflammatory effect on international relations. Judicious editing eventually removed offensive references to specific foreign powers. <laughs> It was an era of cheap talent. The extras were plentiful, and new faces were always cropping up. And then I was uh, given some parts. And I think one of the very first parts was a little comedy. And um, Bessie Wharton, Mrs. Leo Wharton, played the part of my mother. It was a, a silly little thing where there was, uh, I was supposed to be a very wealthy girl and uh, this count was going to come from England and the idea was matrimony. So, um, well, I have, I have a little picture here. I don't know whether you can see it or not. 
But this one here, I'm sitting at the table, and Bessie Wharton, right here, is my mother. And she's reading a note uh, about this very important visitor. And I'm quite impressed. So then, this still, and these are the only two which I have. I'm very, very sorry to say. I'm all dressed in my very loveliest dress. And uh, I am standing in the bedroom about to go down to meet this very important count. And Bessie Wharton, my mother, stands here. And I whirl around and say, how do I look, mother? Well, that ground is golf course and everything now, you know. But that used to be all swamp in there. There was a part in the hotel. It was, it was in the Ithaca Hotel they took a part where uh, these spies were supposed to have their headquarters. And uh, two or three of the head ones were big men. I don't remember what it was. They wore a gray uniform. Could have been German or anything. I don't know. Well, I, I know it was Warner Owen who was the star of the, of the uh, episode. And uh, it was a long about wartime, and uh, it was a, a spy picture. And uh, Warner was uh, whisked off the shore, off our dock, as a matter of fact, on the west shore. And, uh, Got in the, by boat, by rowboat, got in the submarine, and they went down far enough to <laughs> go out of sight <laughs> and uh, escaped. Their financial dealings were a disaster, worse than any train wreck, real or faked. Their contracts for distribution made every film a failure before it reached the box office. It was the end of an era for the Whartons and virtually the end of entertainment filmmaking in Ithaca. I more often wondered what became of Ted Wharton. Nobody knows. Was he an Englishman? No, he wasn't an Englishman. And people often wondered what became of them. The two brothers went to South Arizona and later west to California. But never again did they find the same level of success. People wondered, too, what became of the films they had made. One story places the blame on the town fire marshal. The films were made with the old explosive nitrate base, and they had been locked away for years in one of the outbuildings on the Renwick lot. Local kids had been stealing the prints, and as any good fire marshal would, he set out to avoid a hazard in the making. He put the flammable prints in a boat and rowed himself a few hundred yards out into Huga Lake. And there, in plain sight of where the wardens had made it all happen, he threw them overboard. And they were lost forever. Forever. 